Good evening. Shall we get started? First of all, let me introduce myself. I don't belong on the stage. Um, <laughs> my name is Peter Scarry, and my claim to fame this evening is that I'm the husband of Martha Bayless, who is the moderator of tonight's discussion. <laughs> um, this discussion, of course, um, is, uh, is entitled An Elitist and a Deplorable Walk into a Bar. We'll let you decide in the course of the evening who's the elitist and who's, who just walked into a bar. Um, my role tonight is to help my wife, uh, who has uh, lost her voice uh, sp spasmodically over the last couple of days. So I'm going to do the introductions and we'll let the, uh, two, the two main participants um, uh, lay out their positions, begin the discussion, and my wife will, will, will moderate that discussion. Uh, I'll be here to help uh, if the need arises, because uh, her voice has been going in and out for the last 24 hours. So with that, um, let me begin by uh, telling you uh, a bit about our two main uh, participants this evening. I'll begin with uh, Dr. Francis Collins, who is the former director of the National Institutes of Health, uh, where he oversaw the work of the largest supporter of biomedical research in the world and served three presidents over 12 years. Dr. Dr. Collins is a physician and geneticist noted for his landmark discoveries of disease genes and his leadership of the International Human Genome Project, which culminated in April 2003 with the completion of a finished sequence of the human DNA instruction book. I think Dr. Collins has been awarded both the National Medal of Science and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. So we are, we're pleased and privileged obviously to have Dr. Collins with us this evening. We're also pleased and privileged to have with us Wilk Wilkinson. Um, Wilk is a husband, father, and host of the Derate the Hate podcast. He grew up, okay. We have some fans. Few. <laughs> Wilt grew up poor, working from the age of 10 years old so that he might have the things he wanted that his parents could not or would not provide. Over the past couple of years, he has assumed a leadership role with Braver Angels, We the People's Project, a working class coalition of people from across the political spectrum committed to working with each other rather than against each other. So, good to have you here, Will. Thank you. My wife, Martha Bayless, uh, teaches humanities at Boston College um, and is a uh, cultural critic and author of several books and um, film reviews and critiques of popular culture. And with that, I'll turn it over to my wife, Martha Bayless. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> when I first began to talk to people about Braver Angels, <clears throat> I got a reaction which I'm sure all of you have gotten, which is sort of, oh yes, kumbaya, love and peace, isn't that nice? <clears throat> which usually means one side instructing the other in what is correct. And I would say, uh, no, it's much more about how to negotiate differences of opinion, how to disagree, and how to learn from those that you disagree with instead of demonizing them. <clears throat> and then my people I was, would be talking to would say, oh, that sounds interesting. Um, and I think if anybody embodies that for me right now, it's these two guys to my left. Um, they were brought together by Braver Angels 
<clears throat> and they do disagree. Uh, they disagreed a lot when they met. I don't know how much they disagree now. Neither of seems to have converted the other <clears throat> to their a complete way of thinking, a whole checklist of things to be correct that you have to believe. That's not their style. And so what I'm going to do, and excuse my voice, I don't usually sound like this, <clears throat> um, is I'm going to try to get them to answer the same two questions about a series of topics having to do with the COVID pandemic. And they will probably ignore me and say what they're going to say anyway. <clears throat> but, you know, I've, I've been a school teacher, so I will keep, them, keep my eye on them and try to keep them in line in some way or other. Um, the first question I want them to address <clears throat> regarding these topics is, what did you get wrong during COVID about that topic? Meaning you, Wilk, and you, Francis, what did you get wrong during COVID about topic A, topic B, topic C? And the second question I'd like them to address, I don't think they're going to stick to this completely, but it's okay. The second question, I, I'm just trying to set a kind of frame. And the second question would be, <clears throat> what did the other guy get right? Um, which is another way of saying, what did you learn from this other person that you have met and have talked so much with, thanks to Braver Angels? So I have a list of topics. <clears throat> it's not long. Um, and I'm trying to take it sort of in some sort of weird, rough chronological order for what that's worth. Um, <clears throat> so, and I'm trying to talk as little as possible because the sound of my voice is a form of torture, even to me. <clears throat> what? Still great. So, um, <sighs> um, <laughs> these are these are paid bots that I have here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, okay, the first topic is the first thing that kind of hit us all. And that is masking. And you can, whoever wants to go first, it's up to you guys. So what did, what did you get wrong and what did the other guy get right? Oh, boy. So let's start at a really easy place. Uh, Martha, is it all right if maybe Wilk and I start off with just like three minutes of a little scenario of what happened to each of us during COVID, just sort of set the stage before we dive into something like masks. <laughs> Thank you. As you heard, I had the privilege of serving under three presidents, Obama, Trump, and Biden as the director of the NIH. And that meant, of course, that I was the NIH director in January of 2020 when the COVID pandemic began to appear in a way that was ultimately the greatest pandemic threat uh, to the world in more than a hundred years. And so it was my job to try to see what we could do to coordinate all of the science that would be necessary to address this. And that meant coming up with a strategy that could develop vaccines faster than has ever happened before, coming up with a way of evaluating whether there were treatments that might work, even things that we already knew about, but also designing new ones, developing monoclonal antibodies. I was not in a position of having a lot to say about the public health measures, but I was certainly in that group that met in the West Wing of the White House to try to decide what to recommend at a time where people were dying around us. I mean, turn the clock back to March or April of 2020, when this really began to hit very hard, particularly in big cities like New York. And at that time, we had no effective way to fight back against this. So I and my colleagues in both the government, the academic environment, the private sector, pulled together the kind of partnerships that we've never done before and didn't worry too much about who's gonna get the credit and made the lawyers stay out of the room because I'm sure they would have objected to having these people all work together and tried to see what we could do as rapidly as possible to come up with a strategy that might save lives. And a big part of that uh, was the vaccine effort. And you've heard about that mRNA approach, which had been under development for 25 years, but had never actually been carried all the way through to an FDA-approved vaccine. And it was a high risk to do that. But we knew that if that 
was possible, it would be quicker. I was totally immersed in that. I was working 100 hours a week for most of 2020. And when that trial was conducted, both the Pfizer trial, the Moderna trial, we all were holding our breath that maybe we might have something here that would protect people because throughout 2020, we really didn't have much. And there was that night in late November of 2020 when the results of the trials were unblinded. The way this is done is you ask volunteers, God bless them, to sign up and say, I'll be part of this trial. And they don't know if they're getting the vaccine or they're getting a dummy shot. 30,000 of them. And they don't know what they got. And the people who gave the shot didn't know what it was. It's all coded. And the people overseeing it don't know until you get to the point of unblinding the data. And that's what happened that night. And I had thought if we had a vaccine that maybe was 50% effective, that would be pretty amazing because vaccines usually fail. And yet it was unblinded. And the result for both Pfizer and Moderna was efficacy 95%. I had prayed about that. I'm a person of faith. And I will unashamedly tell you, I cried like a baby that night because it seemed like the prayers were answered and we had something now that was going to be able to protect against the terrible devastation that we were seeing. And I felt pretty optimistic, like, okay, we're on a path here. And through the first part of 2021, I felt pretty optimistic. But then by the time we got to the point where anybody who could get a vaccine had access to it easily and cheaply, in fact, it was free, it was pretty clear that we had lost some important discussion along the way. And 50 million Americans said, no, thank you. And I couldn't figure out what happened. But there were so many other messages coming at people that good, honorable, wonderful people, people I knew, were suspicious, were uncomfortable, were, they had heard things. It's a hard thing to tell you, but the people who have looked at the consequences of that would tell you there are more than 200,000 people in graveyards in this country who didn't need to be because of this fear that the vaccine might be harmful. When in fact, again, I'm the scientist here and we'll be glad to go into the details of why I say it with such confidence. I do believe there's such a thing as truth. The vaccine actually, while it had rare side effects, let's not put that aside for the most part, this was a lifesaver. Probably saved about 2 million lives in the United States. So we got to that point, and I'm going to stop here in a second and get to masks. Uh, I just wondered what happened. I was naive. I thought, you know, if we had science and we had facts, everybody would come to a common agreement about what to do with that information. And clearly, that was not the way it turned out. I had to recognize that we are not rational actors, I'm not either, uh, that we have other sources of information we don't agree about whether my truth is your truth. And we have a serious challenge to our future if we don't begin to understand how that has divided us. This should have been the moment where we came together with a common enemy in mind, the virus, and instead we ended up oftentimes with different ideas about who the enemies were, and politics got in there in an incredibly malignant way, I'll have to say. So I, at the end of that very painful experience, reached out to my friend David Brooks and said, what are you doing about this? And he told me about Braver Angels. And that's how I ended up more than a year ago joining up with this Truth and Trust project and my friend Wilk Wilkinson, with whom I disagree on a lot of things, but we are still, I think, really trusting each other and really excited to have this conversation and many others that we've had, including on his podcast, which I think has helped a lot of people understand how you address challenging problems in a fashion that doesn't make disagreement disagreeable. So back to your question about masking. This is a mess. <laughs> I just wanted to say one little chapter that happened, and then I will come to the point about what I got wrong because there's plenty of it. You know, early on, when the COVID pandemic was just starting, we did not really know how this virus was transmitted. It was a coronavirus. The other coronaviruses we knew about, that's SARS and MERS, got transmitted. That's why they were so serious, but only by people who were really sick. SARS-CoV-2, the COVID-19 virus, fooled us. 
and turned out to be very capable of being transmitted by people who had no symptoms. That's still true today. So the idea that people should walk around wearing masks early on didn't seem to be necessary. If you're feeling fine, you're probably not infectious. Wrong, but we didn't know it was wrong. There was also an argument about, well, masks are in shortage and we should save them uh, for the people in the hospitals. And that was sort of an argument too. And then we found out we were completely wrong about that. And the opportunity here to turn this into a lesson about science, where you think you have the data, but then the data changes, and then you realize, oh, I have to change my conclusion. We totally blew it on that. And instead, what you suddenly heard was, oh, everybody should put on a mask. And I don't blame anybody when they heard that of saying, these guys don't know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> they told me this two months ago, and now they're telling me that. I don't trust that they really have a clue, and maybe they're actually trying to manipulate me. So what we did wrong, what I did wrong, because I had plenty of these moments in television interviews, is we failed to say, every time there was a recommendation, guys, this is the best we can do right now. There's a good chance this is wrong. We didn't say that. We wanted to be sure people actually motivated themselves by what we said, because we wanted change to happen in case it was right. But we did not admit our ignorance. And that was a profound mistake. And we lost a lot of credibility along the way. And that one, I will not forget. Um, masks with a... Masks were the last item on my list, but that, I mean, no, <laughs> no, I thought they were the first. No, 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 I'm sorry. Um, the vaccine was the last, but that's quite all right. I, I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to go with the flow here. And would you, um, you can respond about the masks, but first tell the kind of overall backstory the way he did. Would you? Oh, would yeah. Be suitable sure. to Yeah, okay. Um, so it's interesting being involved in a project like this because I am somebody who certainly doesn't have the bona fides of a scientist. I have spent more time in bars in my adult life than I did in a classroom. So I, you know, I, I manage truck drivers. I watch people. I like people. Um, I, I like to see how people react to things. I like to figure out what makes people tick and, and what what passes the smell test? So when I was given the opportunity, well, I, I started the podcast in, in the very beginning part of the pandemic because I saw the division, not only the division that had already started in our country, but the division that was coming as a result of the pandemic and how much the pandemic, but not only the pandemic, but the government's uh, response to the pandemic was becoming such a divisive and, and toxic thing for our country. Um, I started my podcast with the intention to tame down the toxicity, turn down the toxicity in this country. And in doing so, I, I just started watching more and more people and, and then myself trying to navigate the pandemic the best that I could, you know, I obviously, I didn't uh, manage the biggest health apparatus in the world, you know, 40 some thousand employees, but I did manage a couple, you know, a couple dozen truck drivers, multiple facilities, dealing with customers. Um, and, and then I also had to negotiate my own home, my, my family, and, and how I would go to work every day and, and did continue to go to work every single day from the first day of the pandemic, not understanding what was going on in our in our country what was happening to the world but at that point i became very you know hyper vigilant in what i was seeing around my my life and, and around my state and, and around the country and as i watched things and, and i watched the people who were given the task of trying to control this thing I began to get more and more skeptical uh, uh, and, and, and it just, and just in all fairness and all honesty, I'm a, I'm somebody who's very skeptical of any time the government tries to inhibit our liberties in any way. I, I look at everything in life first through the lens of liberty um, because I, I think without liberty, all other lives of or all other parts of our, our, our human individuality goes away. 
we, we start to lose everything else. So when I saw the things that I saw on the television and uh, in the papers and online and, and, and things like that, I quickly was like, this is, this is not right. This is, there, there is something that just doesn't pass the smell test, just like I was talking about earlier. So I started speaking out against the, the, the government's response to the pandemic, not even knowing necessarily what was true and what was not true about the pandemic itself. But I knew, and I still know, in my mind, that the response to the pandemic was, in large part, very wrong. So when, when Braver Angels confronted me with this opportunity to speak with Dr. Francis Collins, First of all, I was like, what? <laughs> like, me? Um, this uh, doesn't make sense, but I'll talk to anybody. And, uh, and then it began to make sense because I understood the part where he was coming from, and, and, and I immediately gained a lot of respect for Dr. Francis Collins for actually wanting to step out of that beltway bubble, that intellectual elite bubble for which very, very few people on this planet were getting that opportunity to speak for the people in the Midwest, to speak with the people or speak for and, and, and have an impact on somebody who was partially or, or you know, in, in large part, you know, part of that health apparatus, that, that public health thing. So when I when I learned that and, and started learning about his desire to learn what people like me thought about this, about the government's response to the pandemic, that right there was the first step in, in what's what's become something incredible uh, for, for for me personally. And, and I think what I think that was the first step of, for something huge within this country, because while Many, many people in this room have heard me say it before. Individual responsibility, personal accountability it is one of the biggest things that's going to change the, the world in which we live. And that gave me an opportunity to speak with somebody because I know no guy like me, you know, Wilk with, with a podcast it, it is really going to affect public policy. It is really going to make the make the difference. But if I can speak to a few people that, that get to get in the ear of bigger people and then, and then make things happen. So when I think about mistakes and, and the mistakes that I made right off the bat, um, you know, I, I think about the individual conversations I had to have with the couple dozen people that I manage, you know, because the people that I managed were frontline workers, were people that, that had no choice but to come to work every single day. Um, they weren't the kind of people that could jump on a laptop and, and do, their, do their work from home. They were the kind of people who had, you know, both them and, and, and their wife or their husband, their, their significant other, had to, you know, go to work every day because if they didn't, they weren't going to be able to put the food on the table the next week because they, they were working paycheck to paycheck. You know, they had kids in school that they now had to figure out what are we doing with next week because next week our kids can't go to school anymore. And are we equipped to make sure that their education doesn't suffer? So when I look at those interactions that I had right then, you know, I was trying to figure out how to navigate that. But I was also in some ways angry at the people that was putting or that, that was that were responsible for, for putting those people in that position. So I think while I didn't affect any kind of public policy in the very beginning, there are definitely thoughts that I had in my own mind and, and things that I, I maybe said or did as a reaction to those things that I would do differently today because of the relationship that I've built with Dr. Collins. But it's, you know, 
I can Monday morning quarterback my own moves all day long, but to try and Monday morning uh, quarterback somebody else's, uh, especially somebody who was doing things, you know, totally different, uh, whether it be, you know, Dr. Collins, Dr. Fauci, Dr. Walensky, you know, I can look at all those things and I can tell you that I think that a lot of that stuff is wrong, but I, I, I just, I hope that everybody goes into this with the kind of open mind that I've gone into it with and understands that this doesn't end here today. We've all made mistakes because I can look out. I mean, I could ask you all a show of hands who hasn't made a mistake in here, but, <laughs> and, and, and the reality is, is, is we'll work through this. We will work through this as a nation and it's going to take a lot of humility, a lot of candor and a lot of conversations like, like Francis and I have been having. So, so, Let's just work from there. Um, well, obviously, <clears throat> what's striking about this conversation is that these two gentlemen were able to find each other and talk to each other, <clears throat> but on, an, on the scale of the nation as a whole, communication between the scientists who are struggling to understand this mysterious virus and the public who are coping every day with you know, some sometimes bizarre seeming instructions, contradictory instructions. I think it's safe to say the communication between those two people, the people you represent and the people you not represent, not that you represent them, but you know what I mean, um, was very, very poor. And I guess I'd be curious to hear from both of you um, at the time, and you can pick any any point in this in this history but at the time did you sense that the that the experts the scientific community was not communicating adequately <clears throat> and to what did you attribute that how did you explain that on either end of this uh communication that should have gone better than it did well i'll start it certainly did seem fairly early on that we had a serious communication problem, that we were back on our heels. The science communication agenda and the apparatus uh, for the government might have worked for something 20 years ago. It was not up to speed in terms of the kind of rapid transmission of accessible information. It was loaded with jargon. Did you ever try to find information on the CDC website when you really wanted to try to find it? And it was like horrible. It's impossible uh, to get to the one thing that you were looking for. We were run, circles were being run around the government's communication effort by all kinds of other sources, uh, some of which were helpful and a lot of which were not. And some of them were frankly intending uh, to distribute misinformation. You can call that disinformation. Some of it probably by bots that people didn't even realize uh, were loading up the internet with false stories, but they sounded plausible. We should have had a much better plan about how to prepare for that kind of assault on truth. Uh, and we were continually just trying to catch up with something that had already gone viral. And sort of the retrospective scope on this is if we ever have another circumstance, and I'm sorry, we probably will, then the communication effort about science has to be much more nimble uh, than it has been. It almost has to be ready not just to debunk things that are false, but actually pre-bunk things. Kathleen Jameson, who's a science communication expert at the University of Pennsylvania, said when she looked at this, she could say every one of the most damaging conspiracies about the vaccines, whether it's there's a chip in the syringe that Bill Gates is going to track you or uh, whether this is going to make you sterile. Every one of those was totally predictable, but there was no plan about trying to prepare people. You might hear this, and if you do, check out a source that you might find to be reliable. And so they got hit with it, and there was nothing to counter that for so long a time that it became already a source of many people's concern. And it's really hard. Trust takes, you know, decades to develop, takes seconds to lose, Absolutely. and it takes forever to regain. And when we lost that trust, uh, then we were in this spiral that we were still living with now where 
people are having a very hard time figuring out what are the facts of the matter and who should you believe? Yeah, and as far as communication is concerned, there were so many, so many problems with the communication that was coming out of, uh, I don't care if it was state, local, national, you know, from, from whatever direction that it was coming from, there were just way too many inconsistencies uh, right from the very beginning, way too many inconsistencies and, and too many of the things just, like I said, did, did not, did not pass the smell test, did not make sense contradicting, you know, from one day to the other, uh, you know, Francis mentioned it earlier, how the, the science was changing and that was not ever communicated well by anybody. How, you know, what we're, what we're doing or, or recommending this week could change next week based on the evolution of, of the virus, based on the evolution of the, the information that we get. Um, one thing that I have a real problem with, and, and not, not just me, but the several people that I, I, I mean, dozens and dozens of people that I've, I've had conversations with over the past year and a half is the fact that, especially with regard to, to like the CDC, you know, you mentioned the CDC's website and how horrific the, the, <laughs> the, the well, you didn't say horrific, I think I did, but, <laughs> but I, I will go forth and, and say that it, that it was horrific. Uh, the, the information process with on the, you know, within the CDC's website, and then the whole thing that, you know, there were several studies worldwide that, that it had, had come out months ahead of time and the information was not being updated on the CDC's website. Uh, the, the number of people that that, that affected w was, was, was very bad. Um, the idea that there were studies done uh, in, in state and local areas that there, there was no coordination in the communication between a lot of those state and local, uh, you know, state health coordinators, county health coordinators things like that. The fact that that information was not coordinated, put together, and, and communicated in a meaningful way on a national level was, was a very poor communication apparatus. Um, there, there's, there's so many things there that, that we needed to do better. You know, I, I totally agree. It did not work at all the way it should. In other countries that had systems that we learned from, Israel. I, I had phone calls almost every week with Israel telling us what's coming for us because we didn't have our own data yet. But we have a certain situation here where we have to blame our own government process for having very much underfunded and undersupported public health in this country for many, many years. So if you've talked to somebody who is in one of these state or local health departments, in the midst of this, they were absolutely stretched to the breaking point and also were being attacked uh, for doing their jobs. This is not the way you handle a pandemic, is to have way under-resourced people who are actually feeling as if they might be in danger. That made it so much worse. So we somehow in this country thought, well, we can just, you know, down budget public health and it won't matter. It'll take care of itself. I got to say, if there's one thing that maybe a country ought to do across the whole nation in a uniform way, it's public health. But we don't. It's all done by the states. CDC tries to kind of manage the inputs, but CDC had no data but what the states would send to them, and most of them were struggling to develop the data at all. It's very upside down for anything if you're really serious about trying to protect the people against a pandemic outbreak. Yeah, and that, you know, it, it reminds me of the, the conversations that we had with, you know, Matt Willis, uh, the Marin County uh, in California, uh, the state, uh, our county health coordinator um, out, out there, and the, and the struggles that he, he faced um, out there in California. And, and that leads me to a bigger point, and, and, you know, is when government gets too big, it doesn't do anything well. It just, I mean, that's just part of the deal. So when it's got its hands in too many places, you run out of hands to do the right work. So that is, is a big problem there. So it, it, maybe we need to start focusing on what's actually important and what having government do the things that they're not supposed to. Peter has a question. Nope. I can pick up on what the gentleman is on. Nope. Mike, please. 
Yes? There it is. Okay. So, um, it seems to me you both contradicted one another there, and I'd like to hear more. Dr. Collins asks for more uh, nationally unified health statistics, if not health policy. You're concerned, Will, uh, as many of us are, that the federal government is already too big and overwhelming and, 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 and overarching. So, could we hear a little bit more between you on that, on those two points? Yeah, well. I did promise, I did promise that they would disagree, so here we go. <laughs> well, so, yeah, since I made the accusation, I'll, I'll throw it out there. Um, yeah, our, our federal government, the, the, the apparatus um, that, that is, 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 is our public health system right now is broken. Um, and it needs to be fixed. When, when we, to use you know Dr. Collins' words, you know, faced the greatest pandemic in over a hundred years, uh, it failed miserably, um, in, in many ways. You know, the the communication between health agencies wasn't there. We know that. You know, getting the information to the CDC was done very poorly. As Francis just said, it, it, it was done very poorly. Once they had the information, they processed it poorly. It did not work. They did not get the information to the people, the people that really mattered, the people like me, the people like the, the people that reported to me, the people that were going home each day to their family, to their wives, their kids, um, their their um, their lives did not get the information that they needed in, in a timely basis or any meaningful way to make it make sense. They were forced with, with mandates and dictates and, and, and just people telling them that this is what you have to do because we said so. That is not what the American government was meant to do. They did it that way in my mind, I can't say for sure, but because they didn't know what else to do. They didn't have a plan in place for this because our government is too big to do anything well. They've got way too many things on their plate. The government does way too many things. The government's job, first and foremost, is to protect the individual from undue force and fraud. The government, in this case, in my opinion, was the perpetrator of force and fraud in many instances. Why? I can't say. I'm, I, don't, I don't try to, and that's one of the mistakes that I made in the beginning of this thing, is to ascribe what I thought were the motives of some of the people involved in making these decisions. I have no idea what their motives were. I don't, it, it really doesn't matter, and I'm not here to, to cast blame on any individual. I am going to say that there is a lot of blame for our system, and the system needs to be fixed. And in order to do that, there's a lot of people that need to answer for what happened so we can fix the system. So I'm glad you brought up motives, because I do think when things go wrong, and we both agree things went wrong, um, it's natural for us to say, okay, who do we blame? And how did this happen? I know a lot of the people that were deeply engaged in this. I think they also feel quite badly about the failures of many of the things that they were entrusted to do. But I don't think they had evil motives, uh, not to a person. I think they were in a circumstance of being hit with an unprecedented pandemic. They were radically under-resourced in terms of what they really needed in order to handle it properly. There was this clunky system where 50 states, each of which had its own poorly managed system that was also even more under-resourced, was supposed to be feeding information into a central source by fax machine. I mean, that's how some of the data was coming into CDC. And so no wonder that it all basically failed to give our country what they needed and recommendations were made on imperfect data. But I do hope, because I was in the middle of all this and I know a lot of these people, that you won't fall into the temptation, which is easy to do uh, when things have gone wrong, to think that people were incompetent or they were they had some sort of evil intention. Uh, they were in a terribly difficult space. Let me just say, I think the federal government probably does too many things. I'll go with that. But I think there are some really fundamental things the federal government has to do that otherwise can't get done, like our national defense. Well, we all agree. 
in a, may, in a certain way, I think you can make a case. Public health is our domestic defense. We have external enemies that have, you know, get weapons and guns. And then we have potentially an internal enemy that has a spike protein that's coming for us. Why should we not have just the same kind of resources and intention and coordination for our domestic defense? We don't have it. And so if we think there are some things the government really should be responsible to do, isn't that one of them? And in which case, shouldn't we do a better job of giving the resources that need to be there? Now I'm going to follow up. I think um, it's fair. Absolutely fair. I'm going to follow up on my husband's question because I'm wondering how much of the negative reaction depended on confusion and incompetence and poor communication and how much of it depended on the ingrained American dislike of centralized authority. If the government had been as unified and as efficient in handing down mandates and diktats as, say, the government in Beijing, um, I don't think Americans would have rallied around that especially. I could be wrong, but I mean, it's kind of, I think the blame has, to, not the blame, but the explanation. What do you say to the fact that Americans don't like being told what to do by the government and the more forceful that directive is and the more pervasive it is on everybody and health is, health is different from defense. It gets into your life and into your intimate sphere of your family. If the government had a perfectly unified policy and imposed it on everybody, would that have been better? better? Would that have been less conflictual? Uh, you know, one of the things that, that we've talked about is when it comes to government and positions of authority, and this is something Francis and I have discussed before, uh, is when it comes to information and getting the right information and making policy and doing things like that, there is a right way and a wrong way to do that, in my opinion. And, and you're right. Here in the United States of America, our, our inherent thing that, that we do, and one of the big problems that... that started the problem with the institutional distrust that we now have was the way that that information was put down on us. Mandates and dictates are not the right way. Don't make mandates, make better arguments. That's what I've, I've said from the beginning of this. And Francis and I have discussed this, like I said, so it's, not, it's no surprise, but when there were certain people told that they couldn't say what they wanted to say about it that turned into a problem. We, I mean, we know that. And, and, and that's in large part where that, that wheel of mistrust started turning. And, and our government can't tell us what to do. We are free to do as we think is right when they tell us what to do and it's based in, in, in things that the people just don't understand, they're going to fight back. They're going to turn around and take it back to you. So uh, that's, that's what I've got to say on that. Yeah, I totally hear you. What we haven't talked about, but which is part of the reason I think this ran off the rails so badly, and, and Martha, I hope it's okay if we maybe go to this part of it, is the way in which other voices that might have potentially been a calming influence and sort of a call to let's look at the facts, Americans, let's try to figure out what's right here, uh, in many instances made things worse. And I'm talking about politicians and I'm talking about the media and certainly social media. Uh, China didn't have a problem with politicians disagreeing with the leadership, <laughs> and nor, nor did they have a media problem, but we sure had every possible voice, many of them with all kinds of intentions that were not noble, uh, ready to capitalize on a circumstance where there was uncertainty and resentment and anger and fear and whip that up in the biggest way. And you ran a session this morning about the media, uh, Martha, which tapped into a lot of the reasons why we're in a very difficult place. If we're counting on that influence, 
when we have an area of divisiveness and uncertainty to help, that's not our circumstance at the present time. And that really was hard to watch, and we are in no good place now uh, to say that that's not going to continue. Because all of this, of course, happened not in a blank slate. COVID came along when we were already, as a nation, in trouble uh, with divisiveness about almost everything, but especially about politics. And it was sort of a, a storm you could almost predict was going to break in a really destructive way. And where were the forces that are going to try to bring it back together? Uh, that's uh, The consequence was pretty predictable and pretty awful to watch. That's why I'm part of Braver Angels, because I think there's got to be some other way that the people, we the people, uh, can counter all of these other destructive influences that are continually trying to make something worse than it already is, and it's bad enough. Cass Sunstein has this uh, rule, the rule of uh, polarization. When you put a group of people together who are already sort of on a particular position, they become more extreme after they talk to each other. That's what we're happening, seeing happen right now with all of our tribalism. So if I can, the, the second part to my don't make mandates, make better arguments is, is also about the information and information that we saw online and people, there, there were a whole bunch of bad actors in, in our media, on social media, uh, you know, within our, our government, uh, state, local, and federal politicians that, that use this as an opportunity on both sides to try and do things for, whether it be for personal gain or personal reasons. Like I said, I'm not gonna try to ascribe any motives to anybody individually, but we know that there were, there was not the consensus that was, that, that, that some people tried to make people believe that there was, and there, there was, there was voices out there. I think in my mind, the best way to combat those voices that were coming with bad information was to present it with good information instead of trying to shut down the argument. So, uh, you know, I know on your list was the Great Barrington Declaration. I'm just going to bring it up, um, if you don't mind. Thank you. Don't yell at me. So the Great Barrington Declaration, um, and, and I know this is something that you and I have also talked about, so we're just being completely honest here. Okay, yeah, the Great Barrington Declaration was, for anybody who doesn't know, it, it was a document that was presented by uh, uh, three uh, professors, uh, Stanford, Oxford, and Harvard, uh, epidemiologists, and then, and, and now hundreds of thousands, if not over a million people have signed on to this, um, very much proving that, that there was no actual consensus on what the response should have been. It was very much about a focused approach for the most vulnerable among society. Fauci mischaracterized it in, in, in a way as let her rip, if you've heard that, uh, which was not true. That was never the, the, the intention of it. But so, so the, the whole thing of, of shutting down the argument as opposed to having the argument and, and, and things like that was another big contentious point for the people. So when we, when I think about, you know, don't make mandates, make better arguments, don't shut down the conversation, have the conversation, win on the battlefield of ideas, um, do it in a civil way, but do it in the intellectual, good-natured way that we would do at Braver Angels. Let's say you. I'm glad to talk about this and appreciate the chance to explain a little bit about the context because I don't know that that's gotten clearly explained. So this was October of 2020. We had no vaccines. Uh, people were dying at high rates at that point across the country, but particularly in cities. Uh, there was a hope we might have a vaccine in another couple of months, but nobody knew if it was going to work. Uh, these three epidemiologists, very distinguished by their uh, credentials, were convened uh, in a gathering in Massachusetts by Scott Atlas, who was at that time advising the president. And they put together this short declaration which said, let's stop with the closures of businesses and schools. 
Most people who are under 60 or 65, if they get the virus, they're going to survive. Let's not try to protect them. Let's try to protect those who are vulnerable, the elderly, and maybe some others who are compromised. And uh, eventually, the virus will run its course uh, through the healthier people. And uh, we will be able to get through this without so much damage done uh, to daily life. It was sort of a letter rip as far as the younger people. I, I will Maybe it's not a great phrase, but it was different than what was currently being proposed. Different. That declaration would have been a great opportunity uh, for a broad scientific discussion about the pros and cons. But that's not how it was presented. On the day it was presented, it was presented to the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar. It would have been presented the next day to the president if he wasn't in Walter Reed at the time being treated for COVID. This was an effort to take a very fast track of something which would have potentially been a major change in national policy without the opportunity for any debate or discussion. As somebody who is deeply engaged in the federal effort to try to save lives, I saw this and I was deeply troubled. I regret that I used some terminology that I probably shouldn't, <laughs> that somebody should put forward a devastating takedown of the dangers here, and I regret that. But I was deeply worried, and in a few days, no less than 14 of the public health or associations of the United States all together wrote a scathing takedown of the Great Barrington Declaration saying this would probably kill tens of thousands of people. And so ultimately that was the scientific discussion, but it, the effort was made by the authors and the, some help uh, from Dr. Atlas to try to short circuit all that and get that into a policy decision without the opportunity for debate. So I don't regret saying this is dangerous. It was. That's fair. I mean, oh, you may reply. Oh, oh. And then the timekeeper over here is going to switch over to Q&A. No worries. Um, yeah, so, so no, that's good because I, I, I don't think most people ha have heard it from that perspective. And, and I think the debate most definitely should have happened. There, there are right ways to do things and there are wrong ways to do things. You know, and this goes back to what I was saying earlier, Monday morning quarterbacking things. Um, I'm still personally of the opinion, nothing that, you know, and like I said, not a doctor, never even played one anywhere. But I'm still much more of the opinion that, you know, the, the targeted approach after seeing what we've seen over the past three years, I, I would have loved to have had the, 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 seen the conversation happen. I would still love to see the conversation happen. I would love to see that, that targeted approach over what has actually been happening or happened over the past three years. I, I would love to see that happen in a, you know, morbidity, more mortality, morbidity conference kind of thing. I think it's very important for the, the people. So I think that's a really good point. And in a way, some of those experiments got done in other countries, and we have learned something from that. Sweden, for instance, kind of took that tack from the beginning. Had incredible success. You know, they didn't, Wilk. The first, oh, okay. the first, <laughs> of, you know, after six months, they were doing better. But the first three or four months, Sweden was having a higher death rate than anywhere else in Europe. We'll see. I, I mean, I, like I said, <laughs> I, I think if we can have the conference at some point and, and actually get it all out it on the table, I, I think that's the, that's the best way. I'm totally with you. And, and let me say, because I didn't get a chance to say it yet, Wilk, you taught me some really important things about how this kind of conversation played out in the real world. Yeah. As a guy living inside the Beltway, feeling the sense of crisis, trying to decide what to do in some situation room in the White House with people who had data that was incomplete, we weren't really thinking about what that would mean uh, to Wilk and his family uh, in Minnesota a uh, thousand miles away from where the virus was hitting so hard. We weren't really considering the consequences in communities that were not New York City or, or, or some other big city. The public health people, we talked about this earlier, and this is a really important point. If you're a public health person and you're trying to make a decision, you have this very narrow view of what the right decision is, and that is something that will save a life. 
doesn't matter what else happens. So you attach infinite value uh, to stopping the disease and saving a life. You attach a zero value to whether this actually totally disrupts people's lives, ruins the economy, and has many kids kept out of school in a way that they never not quite require for collateral from. damage. So there, yeah, collateral damage. This is a public health mindset, and I think a lot of us involved in trying to make those recommendations had that mindset, and that was really unfortunate. It's another mistake we made. Okay. <clears throat> I think we're going to go for, for the Q&A now, and my voice is getting so a bit tired, so I'm going to turn it over to my husband, Peter Scarry, to lead the Q&A, and feel free to follow up on... I'm glad you guys disagreed. Uh, it was a beautiful spectacle. Glad we could help you, Martha. <laughs> we did it for you, Martha. Okay, <clears throat> I'll start with this gentleman right here. Please uh, tell us who you are and where you're from. I'm Bruce Moreland. I'm also from Minnesota. You can see I'm a red. I was actually chair of the Republican Party, Rice County, in 2016, so I'm an active Republican. Don't be afraid. Um, <laughs> I'm also a medical researcher, and so my blue friends constantly turned to me to try and figure out what was going on. And the question I had, probably more for the doctor right now, one of the things I kept telling them was that everything is an uncertainty band, and the thing that was really weird to them was people seemed to be dying with COVID, but the news media kept saying they were dying of COVID. Could we have done a better job of explaining the difference between those two terms and how that adjusts the way you think about things? Yeah, we probably could. What do you say about somebody who has uh, chronic congestive heart failure, um, who's had that for five or six years, maybe slowly uh, getting a little worse, and then gets COVID and dies. Did they die with COVID or of COVID? It's a little hard to decide exactly how you define that boundary. And I don't know that reasonable people would always agree. I'm sorry, though, that that sometimes became an argument that caused some people to say, well, COVID isn't really killing anybody. Uh, all these people were going to die anyway. The government is just trying to blame it on the virus because the government has an investment in this being a pandemic so that they can make edicts about what we should do about it. That was not honorable uh, to take it to that extreme. People were dying of COVID. Young people, although we don't want to think about it that much. A lot of people under 60 who were previously healthy died of COVID. I saw examples. So yeah, it was a terminology issue. CDC, again, <clears throat> probably in the place that should have had the responsibility to try to come up with a definition that you could read and it would sort of make sense. I don't think, from what I recall, that we quite had that. And it gave an opportunity then uh, for some mischief, as well as some honest investigation. Set yeah, yep. uh, okay. there's not a lot. I, I agree that that's a. It's definitely a, a, a concern. It's it's one of the things that's brought up very quite you know very often uh, amongst people even still today because there was I believe a lot of mischief, uh, you know, it, within hospitals and 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 especially the media about with COVID versus of COVID and that that's something that has to be cleared up. Again, something I think that could be cleared up in in the right venue. Okay. Uh, the woman in the third row with the hand up, the white house, could you tell us who you are and where you're from? Okay. Am I supposed to hold something down? Isn't it turned on? Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Cynthia King. I'm from Ohio. I am as independent as a human being can be. I've, from the time I could vote, I never right. trusted either party. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> And I also never voted for Trump. However, I read the news on both sides all the time. And this is more a question of polarization than medicine. Oh, and I'm a statistician and I was ordering um, sanitizer for the federal office building where I worked in February of 2020. <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, my recollection was that at the beginning of 2020, 
President Trump was saying, we are going to throw all the money we can at every company that could possibly make a vaccine and whoever gets their first wins. And we're going to have lots of masks and we're going to have lots of everything. And I have never figured out how we, and we did get a vaccine so much faster. At that time, people were saying, oh, well, it's impossible. He, he can't possibly say that we're going to have a vaccine in, you know, 10 months. It's going to take two years. And so how did we get from him saying, we're going to throw everything we can to fight this, to now it seems like people are sort of blaming him for, well, you know, he pretended it didn't exist. I don't understand. Operation Warp Speed. Francis will tell you about that. Operation Warp Speed was put in place by the president. The real architect of it was his secretary, Alex Azar. And basically it was, as you say, this is something we have to pull out every possible stop, find every possible partner and provide the resources. We have to tell companies that if you are willing to play, we are going to pay you in advance for doses of your vaccine, even if it isn't clear whether it's going to work or not. This is how you basically make sure you get through to the end and you have something. That's never been done before. It was very bold. It was kind of like a Manhattan project for a vaccine. People worked their butts off for those 11 months, expecting that probably it would all fail. And then, as I talked about at the beginning, in that November night, here were two vaccines that didn't just succeed, they succeeded spectacularly. That would not have happened without Trump's initiation of Operation Warp Speed and the willingness of everybody to do those things at risk, that the whole thing might have been a total flop. Now, what happened after that in terms of who thought what about whether the vaccines were something people should take? It is, of course, interesting to note if you talk about who is vaccinated and who's not, who are the groups that were most resistant? They're politically aligned. And why in the world would that be right? That something like a public health measure, a medical measure that might be life-saving, the main influencer about whether you do it or not is your political party. I just can't figure that out. Nah, this was this was made political uh, way too soon, and, and and quite honestly, one of the things I say quite often is hate has consequences, and there have been more decisions uh, made with regard to this um, this this well, whether it be vaccine, pandemic, uh, people's personal choices on how they've re related to the pandemic, public policy. I think. And, and like I said, I, I can't look at anybody, any one individual's motive, but I think just on a whole, I think more decisions have been made out of hate for certain individuals with regard to this pandemic than, than probably anything in, in any of our lifetimes. And I think it's very unfortunate. Uh, and I think that's how, I, I think one word boils down to how this became political. It's called hate. So hate has consequences. Hey, um, there's a gentleman way in the back on the end seat. Uh, you just put your hand down when I pointed to you. You're looking behind yourself now. <laughs> and if, if you don't grab the microphone quickly, you're going to lose it. Oh. Okay. Hello, I'm David Hunter from New Mexico. And when I observe the decision-making processes, one thing I often see happen is somebody will declare science has found blank. Science tells us that the best thing to do is isolate. Now, I feel like when this happens, we're leaving out some important steps in decision making. Science and morality are separate. Morality tells me that saving lives is a good thing. Science gives me ideas on how to save lives. So science can, for example, give us some idea of, hey, if we implement this policy on isolation, we estimate it will save this many lives from COVID. Now, why I bring this up is I think by short-circuiting these details, we then forget to ask other important questions. The epidemiologist tells me how we might save lives from COVID. 
Some economists and psychologists might tell me, well, when you implement this measure, it'll do this economic damage. But it turns out economic damage leads to all sorts of problems. Suicides, depression from the isolation. And I feel like that short-circuiting by just saying science has found this is the best step is a problem. And I'm kind of wondering, am I alone in this concern? Has this been discussed much? No. I think you said it brilliantly. Uh, science is a reliable way uh, to get answers about nature. It makes mistakes, but it is self-correcting over time. But it doesn't carry moral consequences along with it. It's what we decide to do with the scientific information that starts to have moral character. For that, you need other insights from faith. And then we have to decide how to put science and faith together and decide, okay, what is truth and how do we decide who to trust? Those four things, I'm constantly thinking about this, truth, science, faith, and trust, they're all out of joint right now. And they ought to be working together in a way that would get us to answers that have the maximum chance of improving human flourishing. And that's not where we are. But let me be clear, I don't think we should as a consequence of what you just said, say, well, when somebody says the science says X, we ought to discount that, but we ought to say, okay, but what else do we need to know before we decide to do Y? You said it really well. Yeah, you, had, you, you said it very well. And, and, and I wanna kind of piggyback on, on what he said and, and, and your question in that when, and, and actually Francis had actually alluded to it earlier, was that collateral damage thing, right? So I, I can only equate this to to things that I've dealt with in my profession, and and I've been on teams where we've had to to accomplish a goal in a in a certain amount of time, and each person with on that you know within that team had 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 a certain thing to do, and I'll just say, let's say the person who's in charge of head count and resource count when it comes to uh, a, a particular issue. And that person's primary goal is to, you know, figure out a way to, to, to whittle down our resources to the most efficient team possible or the, the most efficient pool of resources possible. That's their goal. They often lose sight on everything else within the project because they're so focused on how do I eliminate people? How do I eliminate resources? Anything outside of that tunnel becomes a blind spot for them. They, it becomes a blind spot. When a person, and, and this is just kind of to, to go with your word science, because I think a lot of people, I, I know for a fact a lot of people I've spoken with, so I imagine there's a lot more people out there that, that, that caught on to this and, and that, this, that, that were bothered by this. When somebody starts to act like they are science, that I, I don't know somehow that their name is now science. They they go into this what I call hammer and nail thing. At some point, when you believe you're a hammer, everything becomes a nail, and now all of a sudden, you're just after the nails, and everything's a nail. You no longer are you. You 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 fall into a solid tunnel and you just start banging nails. There's nothing else out there. So you can't be science. No person is science. You know, Even though one of the most brilliant scientists on the planet is not science. Science is a process. And people have to follow that process and try to make the best decisions possible using the scientific method. When people begin to believe they're science, steps get missed, mistakes get made, people get pissed. So one thing that just really hit me now is if we could pose this, the whole coronavirus question as like an ethical problem before it happened, and you were asked the question, what matters more, physically vulnerable people or economically and psychologically vulnerable people? You have to sacrifice some of them. 
you know, it's a terrible decision you'd have to make. So anyone in charge would have to say, how do you balance that? You know, from the medical side, you're going to try to avoid any of those physically vulnerable people getting, getting hurt. But from your side, well, you're talking about what about all the people from the economically vulnerable side? Don't forget them. It's a terribly difficult question. And for somebody like me trained in medicine um, who jumped up as soon as I heard a call for a doctor this morning because like, that's what I'm supposed to do. It is hard to contemplate a circumstance where you say it's okay uh, to let some people die in order to preserve some economic benefits. But there are economists who will tell you what is the monetary value of a life. And if you wanted to try to do that kind of spreadsheet, uh, then somebody would probably be willing to do so. I got to say, it just makes me really uncomfortable. But that's partly because I gave, the, I swore the Hippocratic Oath. And to be able to say, well, that was just sort of conditional on it being okay economically is, is a very hard thing to do. But again, I think, as I said earlier, we probably needed to have that conversation more effectively about COVID than we did. There is a, a definite cost-benefit uh, cost analysis to everything. Um, there are plenty of studies out there. Uh, any psychologist will tell you there are, are definite psychological ramifications to, to, to poverty, to job loss, to you know, people who um, are, are under stressful situations. And, and let's face it, whether it's people who, uh, like me, are, are far more uncomfortable with the government's response to the pandemic than the pandemic alone, or, you know, vice versa. You know, this, this has been a stressful situation for the world. And uh, with stress comes other psychological issues, but the pandemic brought on, and, and more specifically in, in my mind, uh, from the things that I've seen and read, the government's response to the pandemic brought on more of that psychological harm, like, like you know, how do you balance one with the other? Nobody wants to make that decision. It's just like if you're in a home that's on fire and you have to pick between two people and because you can only get one out. How do you make that decision? It's the hardest decision that any human being would ever make, right? You, you have to pick one or the other. I don't think, I don't think anybody wants to be in that position. What I do think, though, is a is a is a situation as complex as this you cannot overlook the collateral damage there has to be a a more a, a bigger and more collaborative effort between all the people the people that look at the health the people that look at the economic the people that look at the psychological the people that look at the uh, like I said, you can't dis dis discount the economic and what it's going to do to people's businesses. I, I mean, how do you tell somebody who has sunk uh, or, or, or has a multi-generational business and they're a small business and it's been in their family for, for five generations, whatever, and, and they just, they're still making it week to week, but that's how they got, they, they, you know, but they're, now they're gone. How do you tell them that it made sense? So it's, there is a, it is a huge problem with collabor or, uh, collateral damage, and it, it, it should have taken a much more collaborative effort uh, amongst all aspects. Gentleman right here. That was your name, please. Hello, my name is Phil Gerson from Seattle. I want to thank first, this is more focused towards Wilk, but I want to thank uh, Dr. Collins after retiring and listening to David Brooks, that you're taking the time to deal with an issue so fundamental to our future. So thank you, Doctor. But, but my question to Wilk is, now that we've been through all this, what we know is that uh, what's going on politically, nobody's saying what's in the interest. Now they're go now the politicians are going after Biden's son and, you know, all the stuff that's going on. So to communicate with the, the people that generally you speak for, you speak for, is what is it going to take to communicate uh, 
two larger groups of those people. I think personally, if I were Biden, I'd start going out and I'd start talking with those people. I'd send my chief people there to understand because Trump captured a, a serious need with NAFTA sending jobs away. Those people needed help. And the Democrats uh, have not come around to truly understand that. So I, I'm asking you, Wilk, uh, beside Braver Angels and you're doing the right things and all the credit for that, what, what do you think would, would make a major contribution to bringing those people to better understand? Right. So I, I think it's a fantastic question. First, I do want to say I, I don't speak for anybody except for myself. Uh, and, and I think individual accountability, individual responsibility is the biggest thing. So when I speak, I try to speak as an example and, and instead of speaking to people or, or, or telling people what to do. So I, I hope that people take that away from, from what I'm doing and how I do it. I try, I try to be an example for the people, many of the people that, that, that live like me, act like me, think like me, um, because there is, there, there, like David Blankenhorn says, right, we all have our blind spots. I, I don't care which side of the political spectrum that you fall on. Now, when it comes to how I act, how I talk, things that I do, I try to be an example for people to see that there is a better way than toxicity. Um, I don't think that when somebody like like Biden um, is constantly using phrases like MAGA Republicans as a pejorative, you know, that is definitely not the way to try and capture anybody's heart, mind, or sensibilities in any way, you know. So as long as you have people on either side, because there's people on, on the red side, the blue side, all along the spectrum that are using that kind of language, that kind of language closes people's ears. You cannot change the heart or minds or, or even get people to think about who they are when you start off by treating them as some subhuman person worthy of or unworthy of even hearing, listening. So we all have our blind spots, but not one of us is not worth talking to. Uh, there's a gentleman in a dark shirt, right? You're, the Warner just turned around. I seem to have a magic touch. <laughs> yeah. Turn around. yeah, so it's, I mean, it's, uh, it's kind of a similar question we've all been asking, but I think Dr. Collins said it very clearly that, you know, as a public health official, they assign, I think you said, infinite importance to saving one life. And that's precisely the problem. That's precisely how we got so many of the issues that we had with the spike in suicides, depression, these kids who will never, ever catch up in their education and who will never be able to socialize like a normal adult. And I wonder what can we do to make public health officials consider the bigger picture and not become so myopic for when the next pandemic hits. Well, you're right. We have an opportunity if we can actually stop fighting with each other uh, to see what we could learn uh, from this really awful experience uh, where more than a million people died in this country alone and many other people were harmed in great ways economically and kids whose education was interrupted in a very damaging way. But we won't get there unless we are able in a sober fashion to step back from it and try to see what lessons there are. One lesson that I certainly can see from this is, and we touched on it briefly, how critical it is for those kinds of policy decisions to reflect the realities of each community. The, the, the fact that we could put blanket recommendations across this incredibly wide, broad, and diverse country and expect them to be right uh, in the middle of a big city and in a rural community, that, that obviously could not have been correct. And yet it's what was done, again, 
give people a sense of uh, good intentions, at least, because of the urgency, the crisis we were in with people dying. We have to learn, though, from that experience that anything of this sort has got to take those local considerations under a serious concern. I do think there's not going to be a perfect answer here. Um, I think if we were to say that the thing that matters most is keeping the businesses open and the kids in schools, there probably would be people who would die as a consequence. Are we okay with that? See, there's no answer here that anybody's going to really feel good about. But we ought to at least have a conversation and know what we're doing and, again, balance it for the local circumstance, which is what we didn't do. Absolutely. The cure is in the conversation. It's, it's, there, there's no way to undo much of what's been done. Um, like the gentleman out here said, I mean, there's, there's kids that have been set back uh, years in their education. Um, there's people that, that will, you know, never recover their businesses. There, there's things that just will not be repaired. There are wounds that will not heal. But going forward, we have to find a better way. And the way to find the better way is to, to bring all the parties to the table get to a point where at least we understand where things went wrong, where things went sideways, and how we can do things better the next time. Showing that initiative has to be the genesis of forgiveness for people. And, and forgiveness doesn't mean saying that it was okay that it happened, but in some way forgiveness has to be the first step to a path forward. I'm really glad you brought that up. Yeah, let's hear her applause for forgiveness. If we could go there, you and I talked a little bit about this. Somebody wrote an article saying maybe we ought to have pandemic amnesty. And we ought, ought to basically say, okay, everybody screwed up one way or the other. Let's move on. And they were immediately attacked <laughs> for having said so, because that means you didn't learn anything. You and I talked about, well, the alternative is to do what was done in South Africa after apartheid, where you have a truth and reconciliation opportunity. And that means, that means people coming forward and confessing what they did that was harmful in public and asking for forgiveness. That's very different than just amnesty, everything's fine. Something along those lines, it'd be really hard to organize, but it might be worth considering as a way to get us past what otherwise is just going to be continual grievance, animosity, and vitriol. If I might, <clears throat> Dr. Collins, you, um, you've now pointed out this evening two sides of the dilemma, it seems to me. This is not a criticism, it's just a comment. You earlier argued... I think forcefully and properly for the need for greater uh, accumul uh, uh, efforts on the part of the national government to uh, oversee data and collect data uh, and perhaps to act on it. On the other hand, you just got through emphasizing properly that we are an incredibly diverse and far-flung nation where there ought to be significant impacts by local and state uh, uh, authorities. This is, again, not a criticism, but that's the dilemma we face repeatedly. And it's you're right to point that out, Peter. But, you know, if we talk about the analogy, as I tried to make a little bit ago, about our national defense against external enemies, we don't have just sort of a generic template of how we're going to tackle a hotspot in the rest of the world. It's very specific for what the threats are and what we need to put there as far as resources. Shouldn't we have that also for domestic defense? One, one thing I, I just want to say something about that and I, and and I agree with with both things he has said there in, in that we do need a, a better federally coordinated effort when it comes to the information and how things were done I think what we need like this country was incepted to be and do is to have all the small laboratories of democracy as people would say how have individual areas, because there were certainly, without question, some states that did better than others when it came to 
their response to the pandemic and how they did things. If we had the places that did things well relaying that and, and those, that information was coordinate or coordinated, criticized, looked at in a very critical way on a federal level and then communicated out to the country as a whole, we would have been in a much better spot. We didn't have that happen. So I think both things can be true at the same time. People can do as they need to do for their local level because government that governs closest governs best. But having that information coordinated is what a federal government is supposed to do to disseminate to the rest of the country. <clears throat> okay. Um, the gentleman in the third row here with the cap on right at the end. Uh, <clears throat> Lou Lee from North Carolina. Uh, I was trying to convince my 30-something-year-old nephew to get the vaccine, and he said, well, I'm young, I'm healthy, I'll be fine. And um, I said, well, a lot of people your age have died. And he said, well, did they have pre-existing conditions? And I said, I have no idea because I can't find that data. And that would seem to be a really critical piece of information, and it shouldn't be that hard to find the data. Yeah, it's another point of a deficit in terms of the data that we wish to have had right real time in front of us. I think in retrospect, some of that data has gotten accumulated. There are certainly people under 40, even under 30, who died of COVID with no pre-existing conditions. It was not common, but it happened. It certainly, and the other part of that, I guess, and I'm sure you said this to your 30 year old son, if you get it, there's a fair chance you're gonna infect somebody else. And some of those other people that you expose to this might actually be pretty vulnerable. And so this is not just about you. Uh, this is also about your responsibilities. Remember, liberty is rights, but it's also responsibilities. Your responsibilities to be considerate of other people who your illness might actually be fine for you, but might be not at all fine for them. That argument, I don't know if that many people actually saw it and acted on it. I think some did. I think it's a legitimate argument. And that's something that I think, you know, reasonable people can disagree upon. I, I mean, that's that's definitely one of those things. But it was very late in the pandemic. They, I think there is, last time I did check, I don't remember how long ago, but you're right, that information was very, very hard to find. And it wasn't until very late in the, in the pandemic response where that information came out. Come to find out that the vast majority of the people that, I mean, the number one, obviously the number one thing that, that uh, was, was, was age, and then the, the, as the number of comorbidities went up, the mortality rate went up. So, I mean, there's that information is now available on the CDC's website, but you're right, for the longest time, it was like, why isn't this there? I mean, it makes the most sense. There's a gentleman who's had his hand up for five minutes. Peter? Well, yes, I'm aware of that. Sir? Which one they're asking? Who are you talking about? Oh, okay. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to ask um, something of Dr. Collins. Um, but what you just said at the end of your statement uh, brought up a, another question, if I, if I may. But the first is, what do you say to the doctors who were threatened by the medical boards to have their licenses revoked, the pharmacists who were told they could have their, whatever, their licenses revoked for Derek pre-vaccine trying to find something, this is mainly private practice, something that can save the people in their community from dying from this uh, vaccine. Um, what do you say to those that were were persecuted, were threatened during this pandemic because they didn't follow along with what the science was saying. And, and secondly, you just alluded to the gentleman should get the vaccine because he will not infect another person if he gets it. And I thought it had been determined that 
transmission was not something that this vaccine covered. It, it helped you, but it didn't yep. help with transmission. So let, let me answer that because I think there's been a lot of confusion. It is certainly true that vaccinated people can get infected and can infect others. I was vaccinated and boosted and I still got COVID in February, as did my wife. I don't think we infected anybody else, but we could have. The, it's, a, it's a matter of the risk, the quantitative risk. If you've been vaccinated and you're exposed to a certain dose of virus and somebody exactly like you is sitting next to you exposed to the same dose at the same time and weren't vaccinated, your chance of actually getting the illness and get, becoming infectious is one third of what theirs is. It's not zero, but it's one third. So it's still the case that vaccination, if widely applaud, applied, reduces the number of new infections, but it's not an absolute guarantee. And that's where I think people got mixed up about the answers. Um, the other question, there were, I don't know exactly how many physicians were pursued about this issue. I think it was a pretty small number. I got to say, there were some physicians on the internet who were promoting approaches to COVID that were frankly dangerous. I'm not talking about maybe this will help you. I'm not even talking about ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine, although both of those turned out to be of no particular use once you did the right trials. No, people who were promoting other things and selling you very expensive nutritional supplements and making millions of dollars while holding a medical license. That is wrong, and I believe those people should have been pursued, and a few of them were. I don't know about too many folks who were threatened by doing something they thought was good and honorable and weren't actually trying to make uh, a lot of money as a result. But I'd be glad to hear about examples if you know of them. We're running a little over, um, which is, I think, okay, but we have to be realistic. No, it's not, apparently. Bill already says it's not okay. <laughs> well, that's then talk to David Lapp, okay? Um, uh, Walt, do you have a question? Yeah. If I get the polio shot, the polio vaccine, will I be If I get the polio vaccine, that means it's over for me. Uh, I'm not going to get polio. I'm not going to pass polio along. I think it's the same with the measles. On the other hand, if I get the flu shot, I might still get the flu. If I do, I might still pass it along. We don't call that a vaccine. And we do? Sure we do. Have you had a flu vaccine? We don't say it's 100% effective for life. We wish it was, but in that instance, influenza, it's not. Because when I go to CVS and stuff, I get offered the flu shot. I, don't, I do get offered the vaccine for shingles, and now I'm safe from shingles. Mostly. Sorry, it's not 100% either. <laughs> you know, measles and polio are wonderful exceptions where this actually works virtually 100% for life. Almost no other vaccines do that. Your immune system is good, but oftentimes it gets uh, a little sleepy and forgets that it should still be able to recognize that pathogen. We still call it a vaccine. It's the same principle. You're trying to prime your immune system to recognize a dangerous thing when it comes along, but it wanes over time. Okay, I think um, Dr. Collins will be taking questions over this side of the stage. <laughs> and <laughs> And we'll, we'll be at the bar with anybody who wants to drink with him. Hey, I want to be at the bar, too. Come on. So thank you all for coming. Thank you to our uh, distinguished visitors. <laughs>